All right, man, peace. You know, I received so many messages and texts from brothers who are asking me to do a video on the Quincy Jones interview. And many brothers told me how Quincy Jones was confirming many of the sentiments that I broach and touch on on my channel. Once again, brothers, this should not be considered controversial in the least. It's pretty much common knowledge by now that in the entertainment industry, they are pansexuals. And if you don't understand that, you're going to be forced to understand that very soon. Because they're going to come out with what they're actually doing in the entertainment industry. And when I say the entertainment industry, I'm not just talking about the movie industry or the singing and dancing industry or the sports world. They're all interconnected. And when they get to a high enough level, they all partake in pansexuality and the veneration of the mother goddess, um, as well as Pan and Bacchus. That is who they venerate. And part and parcel of the adoration, the veneration, the worship of these entities is that you have to partake in certain rituals, that being pansexuality. As usual, with so-called black people especially, they don't like to hear the truth. And I've heard so many people talk about how Quincy Jones is looking for attention and how he's just talking wild and no he's not Quincy Jones is 85 years old and his faculties are just fine he's speaking the truth but when people are trying to maintain this facade in the entertainment industry that everything is on the up and up and that all of these people are being victimized by mainstream media and the internet and everybody's lying on them you're gonna do whatever you can to omit the facts and just deal with the narrative and that's one of the reasons why i have this channel why i call it a pro-truth channel and you guys are going to find i always tell you you guys are going to find that the things i tell you are rock solid in the same way that i told you that martin luther king was a pansexual so is quincy jones and so are the people that he noted richard pryor and marlon brando and james baldwin so on and so forth marvin gay all you have to do is look at these people's family history. Look at their conduct. Look at how their lives ended. Look at what transpired in their lives. And you can see that something was right in Denmark with all their lives. <laughs> you can't get to a high level in the entertainment industry unless you're psychologically fractured. You just can't. You don't notice over and over and over again, Quincy Jones comes from a family that was broken, a mother who had, uh, that suffered from schizophrenia. Marvin Gaye had a father that suffered from uh, mental disorders. Richard Pryor, same thing, right? Richard Pryor was raped when he was seven years old. Marvin Gaye's father was a cross-dresser who abused him, was an alcoholic, and seemed to be struggling with his own homosexuality and tried to hide it with extreme um, religion, what they call the quote-unquote Pentecostal church. Well, he claimed to be a healer. Brothers, once again, there's nobody healing anyone out here today spiritually. I don't care what they claim. The time of spiritual powers ended at when John the Revelator passed. We're no longer in the time of grace, we're in the time of mercy. So all these church people who try to claim that they can heal you, they're lying. Marvin Gaye's father was suffering from mental diseases, most likely from him being physically abused when he was a child. When you do research on Marvin Gaye Sr., he was the victim of extreme violence and borderline child torture, as was Marvin Gaye Jr., the one who went on to grow up and become the singer. All you got to do is look through their family histories. You see these people, oh, well, Quincy Jones is talking about everybody else. How come he's not talking about himself? Go ahead and ask him. I bet you he'll tell you. Ask Quincy Jones, do you like men? I bet you'll say yeah. <laughs> My man Quincy said he got 22 girlfriends. I bet you he got 22 boyfriends too. Just ask him. Any nigga that wear rainbow scarves and all that stuff, he's telling you. He likes everything. That's the world that he lives in. But you know, let's go through this article and let's see what we can glean from it. Because there was a lot that was revealed in this article. It wasn't just about what he stated it wasn't just about what he stated about um marvin gay and marlon brando and richard pryor he said a lot here 
Uh, he touched on a lot of things, but people grasped onto his statement about Marlon Brando sleeping with Richard Pryor and James Baldwin because that to them was so shocking. It wasn't shocking to me. It wasn't shocking to me at all. But anyway, let's read down. In conversation, Quincy Jones, the music legend on The Secret, Michael Jackson, his relationship with the Trumps and the problem with modern pop. We're going to skip through some of this because this is a long article. It says, but in person, the 84 year old music industry mocker is far spikier and more complicated. All I've ever done is tell the truth. Says Jones, seated on a couch in his palatial Bel Air home and about to dish some outrageous gossip. I've got nothing to be scared of, man. What does that translate to? He's protected. He's very high up. As a Wiccan, he is, an, he's, he is on an extremely high level. They asked Oprah about Quincy Jones. You know what Oprah says? She said, I have nothing to say about Quincy. I love Quincy. What does that mean? Oprah knows that Quincy is very high up on the hierarchy. And he can't be touched. When you say certain things in the interview like he stated, talking about Sam Giancana and President Kennedy and talking about Joe Kennedy, his father. When you're saying those type of things in print and talking about Frank Sinatra, those were those were made men. For him to say those type of things, he was a made man. He talked about how Frank Sinatra gave him his ring when he died. Quincy Jones is a made man. Can't nobody fuck with Quincy Jones. Um, you could try it at your own peril. And a, a macher is basically just a person who's like a jack of all trades. He's very proficient in numerous things. It says here, currently in the midst of an extended victory lap ahead of his turning 85 in March, a Netflix documentary and a CBS special hosted by Oprah Winfrey are on the horizon. Once again, you see that connection with Oprah. As I stated, she attests to the fact that she loves Quincy Jones. What does that mean? He is one of her handlers. How can you tell that? By his own testimony, he's the one who got her the role in The Color Purple, as well as providing the score for the movie. He worked hand in hand with Steven Spielberg. OK, so that is why, once again, Oprah Winfrey will not speak against him. Quincy Jones is very high on the hierarchy. He is a top level wizard or Wiccan, whatever you want to call it, druid. Jones, dressed in a loose sweater, dark slacks, and a jaunty scarf, talks like he has nothing to lose. He doesn't. He doesn't. Quincy Jones has already popped every broad he wanted to pop. Most likely popped every dude he wanted to pop. If he dies tomorrow, he's ready. And he knows they're not going to do anything because of his status. He name drops, he scolds, he praises, and he tells and retells stories about his very famous friends. Even when his words are harsh, he says them with an enveloping charm, frequently leaning over for fist bumps and to tap me on the knee. The experiences I've had, he says, shaking his head in wonder. You almost can't believe it. Oh, I believe it, Quincy. I believe you're a super freak. That's part, that's part of that world, man. When they worship Pan, they get involved with, in, with those orgies. Oh, yeah, that's that world. And like I, like I stated, they intersperse the music world, um, high-end government officials, athletes. They all come together. Okay? That's why you have people like Hugh Hefner. His job is to provide enough holes to satisfy everybody. Then when they get tired of the holes, then they have the underground man provide the little boys. You work with Michael Jackson more than anyone he wasn't related to. What's something people don't understand about him? I hate to get into this publicly, but Michael stole a lot of stuff. He stole a lot of songs. Donna Summer, State of Independence, and Billie Jean. The notes don't lie, man. He was as Machiavellian as they come. This is one of the statements that he made. This is one of the main statements that he made that angered people. Why is that? Because Michael Jackson has probably one of the most powerful cult of personalities on the planet. What's funny, though, is that before Michael Jackson died, he was the laughingstock of the Western world. 
people in America, especially so-called black people, they spent most of their time mocking Michael Jackson. And then as soon as he died, everybody became a huge Michael Jackson fan again. That's how capricious and phony people are when they claim to be your fans. Okay? That's why I laugh at that notion of fandom. Michael Jackson was one of the more castigated people in Western society until he died. And people can try to act like that, that period never occurred, but it did. And do I doubt Quincy Jones? No, I don't. Does it make Michael Jackson any less of an all-time great entertainer that he bit off a riff from another talented artist? No, it doesn't. It happens all the time. You know how many of your favorite rappers have a hook, a chorus, even a whole verse from some nobody who gave them their rap demo and they just took the whole verse or took a whole beat? They don't care. They've all done it. Don't matter how big their name is. They've all done it. So, I mean, it, it's just whatever. Michael Jackson was not what you call a talented musician. He didn't play instruments. What Michael Jackson was, he was extremely gifted in regards to his ear, his ability to arrange music. He wasn't on the level of a Quincy Jones. That's why he needed a Quincy Jones. But Michael Jackson was known to be able to sound out the instrumentation to assist his bandmates to tell the trumpet player the horn player, the piano player, this is how I want it to sound. He could vocalize it. And you see that a lot with super talented singers or performers who have not been classically trained in instruments. But what Quincy Jones had, he had that same gift, but he also could play a multitude of instruments and he was classically trained. Quincy Jones was accepted to one of the high end, um, one of the high end institutions in Seattle, Washington, he even attended there for a year with Clint Eastwood. And Clint Eastwood, by the way, even though he has that big macho image, Clint Eastwood, his, his first publicist when he got into the movie industry was a homosexual who was known for making all of his, um, all of his new recruits sleep with him in order to get roles. So we know how Clint Eastwood got on. Uh, he had to get somebody off to get on. But anyway, let's read on. How so? Greedy man. Greedy. Don't stop till you get enough. Greg Philinganis wrote the C-section. Now, this person, Greg Philinganis, is an extremely talented instrumentalist. I believe that he plays uh, the keys, the piano, and he's been very, very, very well renowned throughout the music world from the mid 70s all the way down to now. I saw a feature on the Michael Jackson Off the Wall album that was done. I believe it was for Showtime. And Greg Philinganis was on that was was in that documentary and he went through step by step how they compiled many of the songs that were used on the Off the Wall album, which was Michael Jackson's breakthrough singular album, which also was executively produced by Quincy Jones. Please keep in mind for the people who claim that Quincy Jones is quote unquote hating on Michael Jackson. Quincy Jones executively produced Michael Jackson's three biggest albums, Off the Wall, Thriller, and Bad. He was the, you know, he was the Svengali behind all that. Says Michael should have given him 10% of the song, wouldn't do it. What about outside of music what's misunderstood about michael quincy says i used to kill him about the plastic surgery man he'd always justify it and say it was because of some disease he had bullshit how much were his problems wrapped up with fame quincy says you mean with the way he looked he had a problem with his looks because his father told him he was ugly and abused him what do you expect well once again michael jackson was another monarch child who was raised in an extremely abusive home to prep him for the entertainment industry. For those of you who don't know, Michael Jackson was the seventh child that was born to Joe and Catherine, to Joe and Catherine Jackson. And the child that was born before him died soon after childbirth, right? And I put that in quotes because oftentimes that the, when, they, when they're trying to create what they call a moon child or a child with a high level of Luciferian energy, that they want to make sure it's going to become very huge in the entertainment world. 
they will kill the, the child that's born before that as a sacrifice. Okay? Now, Joe Jackson, for those of you don't, who don't know, was former military. So, do I believe that he was Michael Jackson's first MK handler? Yes, I do. Jermaine Jackson is on record as stating that he knows for a fact that Michael Jackson was subjected to uh, sexual abuse by many of the record executives throughout Hollywood. That Joe Jackson would take Michael to meetings with record execs overnight and then bring him back home the next morning. You can read in the book by Bryce Taylor, Thanks for the Memories, I've mentioned this before, where she explicitly states that she witnessed Michael Jackson and the Jackson 5 get raped before their first performance on Ed Sullivan. She states that. So if you want to talk about the things that Quincy Jones is not mentioning, he's not mentioning the MK Ultra aspect. Why is that? Because he's a top handler. He's probably on programmer level, to be quite frank with you. Because when you're Quincy Jones and you have direct Svengali connections to Michael Jackson and Oprah Winfrey, who are two of the top MK assets of the last 40 years, you have to be a big wig. There's no doubt in my mind about that. And when you're talking about a film like The Color Purple, that was a major transformative film in promoting the separation of the black female and black male in America that was utilized in the early to mid 80s to um, further destroy the so-called black community. This was right in the middle of the crack epidemic because it came out in 85. So Quincy Jones was involved with that. So if you're going to nitpick Quincy Jones, don't try to nitpick him like he's some guy looking for attention. Quincy Jones don't need any attention. Like Quincy Jones is considered what they call rock royalty. Meaning a high level servant to the cause of the quote unquote Lucis Trust or the Luciferian agenda. He, you, you're not messing with him. OK, he's he is a he is a controller. He's a handler. He's not an asset. That's why you see him being connected to people like Frank Sinatra and Elvis Presley. He was one of the trumpeters at Elvis Presley's first big performance for a heartbreak hotel. Quincy Jones was. So he, he is everywhere. That's why he calls himself the Black Forest Gump. And he should. He deserves that title. So it says here, how much were his problems wrapped up with fame? Quincy said, you mean with the way he looked? He had a problem with his looks because his father told him he was ugly and abused him. What do you expect? We already went over this. His father was a handler. It's such a strange juxtaposition how Michael's music was so joyous, but his life just seems sadder and more odd as time goes by. Uh, well, no, Michael Jackson's life seems sadder and more odd if you believe the narrative. If you understand the truth, then nothing should shock you. Nothing should shock you. There's a reason why all these people are always dying over drug overdoses. They hate their life. They're pawns. They're puppets in that industry. And they don't see any salvation for themselves. So they end up just killing themselves. I mean, people don't see anything strange about that. Elvis Presley dies. Drug overdose. Whitney Houston. Drug overdose. Michael Jackson. Drug overdose. Prince. Drug overdose. <laughs> All these people dying from drug overdoses. All right? What's this guy named from The Doors? Uh, uh, Morrison? Drug overdose? Uh, what's my man's name? Jimi Hendrix? Drug overdose? You know what most of them have in common? They were all ferried into a uh, MK Ultra enclave known as Laurel Canyon, located in uh, yeah, California. The, the valley area known as Laurel Canyon, you could look it up. Uh, that was an enclave where they sent many of their monarch assets who they knew that they were going to push and promote in the late 60s. They, they prepped them in the mid 60s. Right? Like the Beach Boys were out there. Uh, like I said, uh, what's my man's name? Uh, Jimi Hendrix. Janis Joplin, she was out there. That's the broad name, Janis Joplin, that crazy chick. Like I already stated, Jimi Hendrix, Jim Morrison from The Doors. Oh, and notice with Jim Morrison, what was his number one hit? What, what song were The Doors known for that was the number one hit? Um, Light My Fire. 
<laughs> that was a quote unquote illuministic group. All those groups that sprang out of the 60s, what they call the um, the hallucinogenic groups, the uh, LSD, PCP using groups, they were all monarch children. They were all sprouted up from the MK Ultra program. When you research them, all of their parents were military. All of them. When you look at the artists that were located in the Laurel Canyon region, the Beach Boys, the, uh, the Doors, the Birds, the Mamas and the Papas. Uh, now I'm trying to remember if the Beach Boys, if their parents, if uh, Daddy Wilson was military. I can't remember whether he was or not. But it's very clear that they were a monarch group. They were an MK Ultra group. They were directly associated with Charles Manson. A lot of people don't know that about the quote unquote Beach Boys. On their album Pet Sounds, you can see on the cover of their album, they're venerating the goat, a uh, pen. Their, their songwriter, or one of their chief songwriters, I believe, was Brian Wilson. He suffered from a series of mental disorders throughout the 70s. And they tried to have a, an MK handler control him. And, and he just had a series of breakdowns. Who else was out there? I think I, think I named most of the birds, Mamas and the Papas, Hendrix. And then, of course, you had the Manson family killings, which were based off of Charles Manson, who was also MK Ultra and was associated with the Process Church. But, you know, let me just get back to the point. I'll, I'll do videos about those topics in the near future. I'll probably do something on Laurel Canyon and the rock groups that sprang out of there. That was a uh, MK Ultra sub project, but that's neither here nor there. In regards to Mr. Uh, Quincy Jones, he's connected. And when I say he's not an asset, I mean, he's not an asset like on the level of these musicians. Like he is high level. He truly understands musical theory. He understands how to communicate messages just through melodies and beats. He's what the scriptures call an enchanter. Like when you read Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter, starting at the 10th verse, it tells you about enchantments. In the ancient world, they could put spells on you through music. They understood how to do that. And they understand how to do that today as well. People just don't grasp that. Uh, there was a whistleblower named John Todd who came out in the 1970s and talked about how they pray over the masters of all of these quote unquote artists music before they release them to the public. So they could put spells on the music and the recipient, the hearers can, you know, of course, receive the spells and be put under the witchcraft. But anyway, let's continue on with this article. It's such a strange juxtaposition how Michael's music was so joyous, but his life just seems sadder and more odd as time goes by. Yes, but at the end, Michael's problem was propofol and that problem affects everyone. Does it matter if you're famous, big pharma making Oxycontin and all that shit is a serious thing? I was around the White House for eight years with the Clintons and I learned about how much influence big pharma has. It's no joke. OK, now he goes into his astrology. Propofol was one of the main drugs that was used to control Michael Jackson. OK, they use a different drug to control Prince. Yeah, with well, Prince, I believe it was fentanyl. Uh, propofol and, and fentanyl are directly correlated. They're related. I believe that they're both used for anesthesia. But that just goes to show you the type of strong drug usage that is required by many of these assets as they start to plunge um, and their lives start to disintegrate. Let's read on. I'm going to read. I'm going to skip a lot of this bullshit here. Okay, he asked him, what's something you wish you didn't know? He says, who killed Kennedy? Now, this, was, this, this is not something that he's supposed to say. But that, that, just, that just tells you that Quincy Jones don't give a shit. And he realizes that he's a made man, that he's connected. And he must also know that they're planning on spilling the beans in regards to who killed Kennedy pretty soon. Remember, under the Freedom of Information Act, eventually all this data is going to come out on many of these overly glorified figures from the 60s. And... Many of the man worshippers are going to be surprised and shocked when they learn a lot of the real information about the heroes that they were told to venerate back in the 70s and 80s and 90s. 
You already see what they revealed about Martin Luther King. They kind of swept that under the rug, but that's okay. As I already stated about Martin Luther King, they have over 800 pages of information on him that they have in a file marked obscene. And when it comes to John Kennedy, even though he's glorified as the Prince of Camelot and all that bullshit, he loved to sleep with 13 and 12 year old girls, uh, MK sex kittens, right? Allegedly. You can read about that also in um, many of the MK Ultra books that have been written by both Bryce Taylor and Kathy O'Brien. Says who did it? Sam Giancana. The connection was there between Sinatra and the Mafia and Kennedy. Joe Kennedy, he was a bad man. He came to Frank to have him talk to Giancana about getting votes. Yes, that allegedly is how Kennedy was able to beat Richard Nixon in the 1960 election or selection. Uh, Giancana assisted him in winning the state of Illinois because the mob controlled that whole area or Giancana controlled the whole Midwest. Now, Sam Giancana, if I remember correctly, was also directly associated with Eddie DeBartolo who went on to own, or the DeBartolo family, who went on to own the San Francisco 49ers. That's one of the reasons why the NFL got them out of being able to have a team, because they were so dirty. If the FBI were to expose what they know about some of these families that own these NFL teams, it crippled the NFL. That's what I mean when I say, when you got these guys talking about, all these games are rigged and that's rigged and this is rigged, like, you're not talking about real shit. You're talking about you talking about little silly shit. Things that you don't really fully grasp and understand. The NFL is big, big business. And um, I mean, that's another topic for another day. Let's read on. Let's see here. Talking about Charlie Parker. Oh, now he's talking about Jimi Hendrix. Let me see here. Wasn't Hendrix supposed to play on? Gula Matari. He was supposed to play on my album and he chickened out. He was nervous to play with Toots Thielmans. Toots Thielmans was a very, very famous. Toots Thielmans was a very famous player of the harmonica, among a few other instruments, but he was well renowned for his play of the harmonica. Herbie Hancock, Hubert Laws, Roland Kirk. Those are some scary motherfuckers, that's what he said. This was one of the greatest soloists that ever fucking lived. Let's see here. Jimi Hendrix was a monarch child, by the way. His father was military. What do you think when you first heard rock music? Rock ain't nothing but a white version of rhythm and blues. I agree with that. Rock and roll, all that is is rhythm and blues. But instead of playing on the two and the four beat, they play on the one and the three beat. That's all rock and roll is. They took the rhythm out of it and they just... <laughs> they just went with their own version he said you know I met Paul McCartney when I was 21 what were your first impressions of the Beatles that they were the worst musicians that they were the worst musicians in the world well that makes sense because they were put together by the Tavistock Institute the Tavistock Institute is a think tank over in Britain uh, they're the ones who put the Beatles together many of those groups that came overseas from Britain were set up by the Tavistock Institute. Uh, there was a concerted attempt to take what they call rhythm and blues or the initial form of rock and roll that was developed by so-called black artists, transition it over to Caucasian artists so that they could use it to spread a certain vibration across the world. So that's why you'll see all these groups that came out of Britain in the early to mid-60s they're all Thelemites, meaning they're all venerators of Aleister Crowley. Like the Beatles, they were heavy into Aleister Crowley. Um, for those of you who don't know, Aleister Crowley was the founder and leader of a group known as the OTO, the uh, Ordo Templi Orientis, which basically just is a modern day form of, of uh, like an amalgamation of various Eastern philosophies and religions um, and Luciferianism. Okay, so Aleister Crowley was a student of Madame Blavatsky. Uh, like I stated, I believe that he came out of the Order of the Golden Dawn and then formed his own organization known as the OTO. And you had certain people who sprang out of there like Gerald Gardner. 
I mentioned Gerald Gardner in the video I did on Wiccanism. Okay. Most of this came out of Britain. The Caucasians in Britain came up with a lot of the modern day form of Luciferianism that they pretty much were able to compile from ancient, from ancient Babylon. A lot of the records and the, um, the, uh, the systematic protocol for how to conjure up demons and spirits that they were able to decipher from the artifacts that they found from ancient Kemet and ancient Babylon. That's basically what Wiccanism is or, or the uh, OTO. And the vast majority of these British rock groups, they're heavily steeped in that. That's why Charles Manson believed when he was listening to the Beatles and the song Helter Skelter that he was being given subconscious directions to start the, the race war. That's what those murders were about. Okay? The Process Church started over in Britain. Charles Manson claimed to be an affiliate of the Process Church. The Process Church was started by a man, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, named Robert Grimston. And his wife was last name McLean. I can't remember her first name, but her last name was McLean. I believe her first name was Mary. She claimed to have had a relationship with the all time great boxer, Sugar Ray Robinson, who, by the way, was a 33rd degree Mason. All right. Ray Robinson was a Luciferian. That's why I tell you, brothers, all this stuff is connected, man. When you when you <laughs> when you start to to investigate this stuff it's all connected. That's why I say the sports world, the politic world, the entertainment industry is all together. So point being is this. When Quincy Jones starts talking his shit, he's not talking to expose anybody. Quincy Jones doesn't need that. It's just that it's time for certain information to come out. Yes, does he have a book coming out and things like that? Yeah, but he don't. It don't matter. He's Quincy Jones. He still has production points coming in from the 50s. By the way, that's, that, that's his axe to ground with Michael Jackson. For people who might be wondering, why is he saying this about Michael Jackson? If he has any axe to ground with Michael, is that he feels like the, the posthumous album that they released, This Is It, had a lot of his production work that they tried to tinkle with so that they wouldn't have to pay him. That's what he's mad about in regards to the, to the Michael Jackson estate. But do I believe that what he said was sincere? Yes, I do. Now, in regards to Michael Jackson having vitiligo, according to the medical reports, he had vitiligo. Which, I mean, it wouldn't shock me. The brother was under so much stress. Who the hell knows? He might have been leprous. Who knows? What were your first impressions of the Beatles? That they were the worst musicians in the world? They were no playing motherfuckers. Paul was the worst bass player I ever heard. And Ringo, don't even talk about it. I remember once we were in the studio with George Martin and Ringo. Had taken three hours for a four bar thing he was trying to fix on a song. He couldn't get it. It's because the Beatles were not a real group. They were put together by the Tavistock Institute. Okay? <laughs> the Beatles were not a real song group. Their job was to create songs that would appeal to people's subconscious to do things like smoke weed and do heroin and do cocaine and worship, uh, venerate Lucifer and worship Satan. That was their job, believe it or not. Um, if I ever do a, a video on the Beatles, I'll, I'll address all that. But they also worshipped um, Pan, as all these groups do. They all worshipped the goat god, right? Or as he really is known as Kunum, right? Talking about Kush, a.k.a. Uh, uh, Nebo or Bell, Quincy Jones also also venerates Bell, by the way. That's how he found uh, Will Smith. Will Smith is, uh, is under the programming as well. Quincy Jones created that show, The Fresh Prince of Bel Air, as a showcase for Will Smith, who they had plans for from the start. Okay? The Prince of Bel is talking about Heru. Okay? Bel was the Babylonian name for Cush, or he was also known as Nebo, Bell the Confounder, Bell the Riddler, the Diviner. All right. So Bell was known in in um, Kemet as Ptah. And when you're talking about the son or the prince of Bel Air, it's talking about Heru. So that is who Will Smith is. That is why he was pushed and promoted so hard in the 90s. He had to do that ritual 
in the film Six Degrees of Separation. And after that, his career skyrocketed. Right. Independence Day. What is Independence Day about? I mean, it's about a, a series of things, but Independence Day is talking about the time period where the mother goddess and her son rise together. All right. After the mother goddess disappears for 70 days, the serious star, she reappears on July 4th, holding her son's hand, the serious star and the sun. Right. Or Heru. That was a showcase for Will Smith, the film Independence Day. And then, of course, what was his next big film? Men in Black, talking about the veneration of Saturn. And you'll see Saturnian worship all over the television if you know what you're watching. I'm going to do a video on that very soon. Let's see here. I'm going to skip down a little bit. So Ringo comes back and says, George, can you play it back for me one more time? So George did, and Ringo says, that didn't sound so bad. And I said, yeah, motherfucker, because it ain't you. Great guy, though. See, Quincy Jones knows the truth about a lot of these people, but he, he can't say everything. He knows some of these people are just plants in the industry, but he can't say everything. Like, there's a lot, a lot of things that he knows about Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra was the number one MK handler in the Las Vegas region. He controlled Marilyn Monroe. He had the keys for Elvis. He had a lot of people's keys. All right. Very brutal dude, uh, Frank Sinatra. He can flip on or off. I'm going to skip down. Let me see. I'm going to keep skipping, keep skipping. Let's get to the good stuff. Oh, here we go. But what about the alleged behavior of a friend of yours like Bill Cosby? Is it hard to square what he's been accused of with the person you know? And um, Quincy says it was all of them. Brett Ratner, Harvey Weinstein. Weinstein, he's a jive motherfucker. Wouldn't return my five calls. A bully. See, that's what he's mad about. Quincy get mad when people don't, <laughs> don't give him his just due. Because he knows everybody in the industry, including him, are depraved. Somewhere in this interview, either this interview or the one that I read with, that he did with GQ, he says that Bill Cosby is the one who called him to tell him that the murders committed by the Manson family occurred. And Quincy Jones states that he was supposed to be there because Jay Sebring was a quote unquote friend of his and had invited him over to Sharon Tate's home that night. Now, this just shows you how how much everything is connected. Jay Sebring, for those of you who don't know, was an out and out homosexual hairdresser in Hollywood during that time period. Quincy Jones says that him and Jay Sebring used to quote unquote hang together. So you know what that really means. That was one of that was one of Quincy Jones's boyfriends. Let's be for real. Allegedly. They were supposed to go to Sharon Tate's house. For those of you who don't know, Sharon Tate was an, was an initiated witch. That's why she's that's why most of the films that she starred in particularly in the mid to late 60s, had to do with witchcraft. The Manson family was dispatched over there by uh, asset of the process church, Charles Manson, to go and kill those people to try to frame the Black Panthers to try to initiate a race war. That's what Charles Manson stated. He, he dispatched those people to go kill Sharon Tate and whoever was there to do to start a race war. They wanted to pin the murders on the Black Panthers, who were also a Saturnian organization, by the way. They were Marxist, the Black Panthers. Huey P. Newton was put under the programming when he got locked up. They locked up Huey P. Newton in the late 60s. They put him under the programming. One of Huey P. Newton's close associates slash friends was Jim Jones. Okay? You brothers can look that up. He even, he even went out to visit Jim Jones' uh, group. I believe it was called the People's Temple down there in South America before uh, Jim Jones had all those people put to death. 911 people, by the way, which I'm sure most of you brothers know. But point being, brothers, is that all this is connected. You know who else stated that he was supposed to be there that night at Sharon Tate's house but wasn't? Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee <laughs> was a uh, Bruce Lee was the fight choreographer 
on a film that Sharon Tate was doing. I think it was called The Wrecking Crew, but you brothers could look this up. I, 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 I want to say that James Garner was in this movie also, but I might be wrong about that. Well, Bruce Lee said he was supposed to be there. And Bruce Lee said if I was there, it wouldn't have went down like that. That's what, <laughs> that's what Bruce Lee said. <laughs> I'm going to do a video about Bruce Lee very soon. But just getting back to Bill Cosby, um, Bill Cosby was a major handler that they're taking down. Borderline program, I touched on him already. Straight out of naval intelligence. Uh, filtered through uh, the Disney front for the CIA. Um, just look at a film that he did called The, the Devil. Uh, I think of The Devil and Max Devlin, where he plays Satan himself in that movie. Oh no, Bill Cosby, that man is off as hell off as hell a lot of brothers got mad when i stated that he was involved in the sexual adulteration of those women he was involved all right this is not a pro-black channel i'm not here to talk about how everybody black is good sorry it, it don't work like that here if you need to hear that shit you got to go somewhere else it says what about cosby though quincy says what about it were the allegations a surprise to you? He says, we can't talk about this in public, man. In other words, <laughs> Quincy knows that there's a lot of dirt on Bill. Believe me, the shit that, that Quincy said in this, oh, this is nothing, man. It's nothing. Let me jump down. Oh, this is what he talked about, Ivanka. Ivanka's a little sex slave. That's nothing. I, I've been told you brothers that. You can look at a video that I did a long time ago when Ivanka Trump got interviewed by Gail King. And I purposefully used as, as the thumbnail for those two videos her sitting on her dad's lap. Because that's how those children get broken in. All right. They get abused by their parents. OK. So I know some people gonna say, well, how do you know that? Look, I'm not here to go back and forth with you. It is what it is. All right. Everything I'm saying is alleged. OK. <laughs> Let's see. Says the interviewer says, wait, really? He says, yes, sir. Twelve years ago, Tommy Hilfiger, who was working with my daughter, Kidada, said Ivanka wants to have dinner with you. Well, Kidada and Rashida would know. They're a couple of monarch children. I'm not going to st I'm going to I'm not going to state what they allegedly were doing with each other. Quincy Jones's daughters, but I'll leave it at that because I haven't found enough verification on that. But I've heard things about them, too. But, but I'll leave that alone for now. OK, so Quincy Jones said, I said, no problem. She's a fine motherfucker. She had the most beautiful legs I ever saw in my life. Wrong father, though. Man, you don't care about who her dad is. These people kill me with this shit, trying to act like they hate Harvey Weinstein. They hate Donald Trump. All these people, they go golfing with these people. You know, off camera, they they you know they they hugging them, they having drinks with them. All that shit is for show. That that liking Oprah and hating Harvey Weinstein and liking this person and hating Donald Trump, that's for the masses who they call the useless eaters. That's for you guys to believe that silly shit. It says, would your friend Oprah be a good president? He said, I don't think she should run. She doesn't have the chops for it. Now, for him to say something like that. When we know that the company line in Hollywood is to say, oh, Oprah should do it. That's how you know, once again, that Quincy Jones is a dude with clout. He's a guy who has a lot of prestige. And he's not worried about saying what he really knows and what he really thinks. He's not going to lie. Everyone else in Hollywood is going to say Oprah will make a great president. Um, I wouldn't trust Oprah to lead a fly to shit. Look at the interview. He's trying to fight for Oprah. She is the CEO of a company. <laughs> this is how pathetic and desperate the males, the average male in America is. They're fighting for Oprah Winfrey to be the president. The liberal male is. Let me specify. The interview says, is Hollywood as bad with race as the rest of the country? I know that when you started scoring films, you'd hear producers say things like they didn't want a bluesy score, which was clearly code speak. Are, are you still encountering that kind of racism? Quincy says it's still fucked up. 1964, when I was in Vegas, there were places I wasn't supposed to go because I was black. But Frank Sinatra fixed that for me. 
It takes individual efforts like that to change things. Well, look, here's the thing about situations like that. You'll have people like Frank Sinatra who will make exceptions for Luciferian brothers. All right. That's how they look at you. Once you're in the craft, you they brother. All right. And they'll go all out for you as long as you keep the secrets. That's why Frank Sinatra would do anything for Sammy Davis Jr., for Quincy Jones. He hooked up Joe Lewis when Joe Lewis was, a, was damn near an invalid when he was going around in a wheelchair. Couldn't pay his bills. Frank Sinatra hooked him up with a, with a greeting job in Las Vegas at a casino in the late 70s. When, um, when Ray Robinson could barely pay his bills, Frank Sinatra hooked him up with movie roles in Vegas and in, and in Hollywood. Frank Sinatra hooked those guys up. You know why? Because they were 33rd degree Masons. Not because he felt like he, like he loved black people or something like that. That wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't the reason. It was that they were all Luciferians. They were 33rd degree Masons. Once again, when you get to that high degree, they tell you that you venerate Lucifer, that your God is Lucifer. I'm not saying that. Albert Pike said that in his book, Morals and Dogma. So don't take my word for it. Look it up. Now, it says here, Quincy Jones, he touches on Bono. He says, when I go to Dublin, Bono makes me stay at his castle because Ireland is so racist. Bono's my brother, man. He named his son after me. Yeah, when he says that Bono's his brother, he must be talking about from a Luciferian perspective. Because Bono's one of the top eugenicists on the planet Earth. That's why they have Bono so, so closely affiliated or associated with making sure that he promotes vaccinations in quote-unquote third world countries. When they say third world countries, that's code word for people of color, quote unquote, people of color. That's Bono's job. Right? He's a knight of the British Empire. When you see those type of terms, a knight of the British Empire, that means that um, he's in the club. He's going to be given a certain task to fulfill and he has to fulfill that task. So whenever you see that type of term, knight of the British Empire, that's a Luciferian. Let's see here. I'm going to skip down because this is all bullshit. Well, I'll read some of this. It says, how about a musician who deserved more acclaim? He says, come on, man. The Brothers Johnson, James Ingram, Tevin Campbell. Well, yeah, Tevin Campbell was um, one of the boys that he sexed into the industry, allegedly. Like people say, well, how come Quincy won't talk about Tevin Campbell? Because... They have not made pedophilia fully acceptable yet. If it was, he would talk about it. Don't you know Quincy Jones is one of the main um, celebrity contributors, not just to the NAACP, but also to GLAAD, G-L-A-A-D, the Gay and Lesbian Association, whatever the hell them letters stand for. He's telling you right there that he's, that, that he's a pansexual. Quincy Jones, if you get him, if you ask, I guarantee if you ask him that question, do you sleep with men or do you like men? He'll tell you. He'll say, yeah. Right? He's showing you what he, what he is when he, just look at his outfit. Motherfucker got a damn scarf on with five million colors on it. Okay, we could skip over all this. Is there an example from the work you did, maybe with Michael, which illustrates what you're talking about? Yeah, the best example of me trying to feed the music, the musical principles of the past. I'm talking about bebop. Is baby be, be mine? That's Coltrane done in a pop song. Getting the young kids to, to hear bebop is what I'm talking about. Jazz is at the top of the hierarchy of music because the musicians learned everything they could about music. Every time I used to see Coltrane, he'd have Nicholas Slanimsky's book. Yeah, he was famously obsessed with the, with the thesaurus of scales and melodic patterns. That's the one you're talking about, right? He said, that's right. Uh, Nicholas Slanimsky, for those of you guys who don't know, if you want to do some research on him, uh, he was a top musical theorist. He was able to categorize many of the basic concepts of music. Um... He's highly revered in musical circles, particularly amongst top level musicians who are interested in musical theory. Let's read down. All 
Let's see. We can read past all this. All this we can read past. Oh, here we go. This is what everybody was talking about. Let me go up a little bit. The interviewer says, you're talking about business, not music. But, and I mean this respectfully, don't some of your thoughts about music fall under the category of back in my day? Oh, you know, before I forget, and this is another way that you know that Quincy Jones is connected. He was the first so-called black man to be made an executive of a major music corporation. That being uh, the, the Mercury Music Group. Uh, he was promoted to the position of, of executive at the Mercury Music Group by a so-called Jew, a Caucasian Jew named Irving Green. I believe his name is or was. And um, it's very obvious that the reason why he got that position is the same reason why <laughs> the same reason why every other so-called black man in entertainment gets a certain position of prominence. All right. Now, I'm not saying that Quincy Jones is not talented. Of course, he's talented and gifted. He's blessed in the realm and the arena of music. But in order for you to be given the keys to a company, to be given affluence and prominence and visibility, you have to engage in homosexuality, period. That's just how it works. And once again, that's why you see all these all these people are going to have their, you know, they're going to have their card pulled in these last days, man. And certain people like Quincy Jones, instead of trying to poo-poo what he's saying, appreciate him being used as a whistleblower. Appreciate it. But anyway, let's see. Musical principles exist, man. Musicians today can't go all the way with the music because they haven't done their homework with the left brain. And you know what's so funny? Like I stated, he was, he was made the executive of a, of a music group called the Mercury Music Group. If I remember correctly, I know it's called Mercury. Maybe it's not called Music Group, but it's, I know the term Mercury is used. And once again, you see the veneration of a quote-unquote pagan deity. Now, Mercury is the Roman name for the Greek god, quote-unquote god, Hermes. Hermes is the Greek version of the comedic entity known as Thoth or Tahuti, the god of wisdom, communication, travel, mathematics. Once again, known in the scriptures as Cush or Chaos. Right, he's also known as Hephaestus. Now, if you're supposed to be Jewish, how come you wouldn't name your music group after something biblical or out of the Torah or even out of the Talmud, whatever? It's because these people in the entertainment industry, they worship Pan. Because, by the way, another name for Hermes was Pan. Okay? The god of, of lust. He's also the hermaphrodite god. I, I brought this out in another video. Hermes made a baby, a child with Aphrodite. And that's where you get hermaphrodite from. Okay? So, once again, the music industry has worshipped, venerated, um, persisted in the idolization of the quote-unquote pagan gods since its inception. All right, so it's nothing new. Well, let's read on. It says, music is emotion and science. You don't have to practice emotion because that comes naturally. Technique is different. If you can't get your finger between three and four and seven and eight on a piano, you can't play. You can only get so far without technique. People limit themselves musically, man. Do these musicians know tango, macumba, yoruba music, samba, bossa nova? Oh, that reminds me. You know who, speaking of bossa nova, you know Quincy Jones, he did the theme for the Cosby show. He did the theme song for, or what we know to be the theme song for Austin Powers. Right? Quincy Jones did that. Salsa. Cha-cha. So, interviewer says, maybe not the cha-cha. And, and of course, here we go. Quincy Jones says, 
Brando used to ch used to go cha cha dancing with us. He could dance his ass off. He was the most charming motherfucker you ever meet. He'd fuck anything, anything. He'd fuck a mailbox, James Baldwin, Richard Pryor, Marvin Gaye. <laughs> the interviewer said he slept with them. How do you know that? <laughs> That's the part where Quincy's supposed to say, "I know that because I was there." I <laughs> I was I was getting some action too, brothers. Look, certain things don't need to be said. I don't, I don't know why people are saying why is Quincy saying that. You know why he's saying that because he ran in those circles, and they did they did their action and they had, they were unabashed about it. They said, yeah, that's what we did, and Quincy Jones probably got some action too. Okay, once again, in the entertainment industry, all the top level entertainers are pansexual. If you're not pansexual, you cannot get into the club. It doesn't work that way. Like you got all these people. Everybody's a transgender. Are, are many of the more prominent members of Hollywood transgender? We don't know about it. Absolutely. Do I believe that every last person is transgender like they try to act like? No, I don't believe that. I think that it's a mishmash of Luciferian and crazy Babylonian ideologies and practices going on there and it's really not that relevant to to figure out that everybody is a, is a transgender okay but many of them i'm sure are that we don't know about but it's not that big a deal they all venerate Luc lucifer anyway and they're done they're finished anyway dude says he slept with them how do you know that quincy jones frowns says come on man he did not give a fuck you like Brazilian music? In other words, that's his way of saying that he was a pansexual. Quincy Jones also. Quincy Jones don't give a fuck either. None of them give a fuck. You know? Well, once again, you guys are going to come to understand that. If you don't understand it already, that's how all of them get down. Like they tried to make some big deal about Puffy Combs being a homosexual like a month ago. Sean Puffy Combs is a pansexual. When you get to that level... They learn about how to worship these different pagan deities. When they talk about, when they get on camera, they talk about God and thank God. They're not talking about the God of the Bible. They're talking about the sun God. Right? Sean Combs, he likes women and he likes men. He likes to do and he likes to get done. All of them are like that, right? allegedly. Right? He has the keys to a lot of these different females in the industry who are uh, who are assets like Cassie that's his asset and when he gets called into the office by top level celebrities like Clive Davis etc he got to get up the ass period Richard Pryor told you years ago that he laid down with a tranny he just didn't tell you that he laid down with other men also he tried to act like that was a one-time thing he, t he stated in his roast that him and Paul Mooney went into uh, some Jewish executive's office and he watched Paul Mooney give that man fellatio. Period. And anybody who looked at Paul Mooney could tell that he's sweeter than the damn Hershey bar. Like, come on. Who couldn't figure that shit out? He could talk all the pro-blackity black shit he want. He's a faggot. Right? Or pansexual, whatever you want to call him, Allegedly. Let's see here. Okay, now, now they're talking about the color purple. When he was the executive producer on the color purple. Once again, Quincy Jones is the one who got Oprah Winfrey the position, or pardon me, the role in the movie The Color Purple. Why is that? Because he's one of her handlers. That's why he advocated for her. He most likely got a call from someone saying that it's time to, you know, go into phase two with the Harpo project or something like that. And he said, OK, no problem. All right. This is who we want you to request to Stephen to cast. And that's that. And that's how that jumped off. That's why Oprah Winfrey will not say anything about him. He is her handler. And, and once again, the movie The Color Purple is just a front to, to promote, um, quote unquote, black lesbianism anyway. The Color Purple is oftentimes used to push homosexuality and lesbianism. That, that color is associated with the third eye. Okay. Uh, 
in the uh, in the tantric circles. Um, when you look at the, uh, the the film Moonlight and the promotional posters for that film Moonlight, directed by Barry Jenkins, um, also starring Miss Janelle Monae, another secret black lesbian who just hovers around Hollywood. Uh, her albums don't even sell, but they still keep her name alive. Why is that? Because she's down with the program. She was in Moonlight. This other dude, Mahershala Ali, who floats around Hollywood and tries to front like he's so masculine. Right, they had him in the, uh, the Hunger Games series. He was also in this film with Matthew McConaughey, uh, Free State of Jones. He floats around Hollywood. Why is that? You be the judge. I already know. You be the judge. Okay. He also was in Moonlight trying to promote homosexuality amongst black men. It is what it is. But yes, the uh, so-called third eye mind activation is also associated with the color purple. Right? Because that's the, that's the third eye chakra. Well, I, I mentioned this before. If you ever watched the film E.T. and E.T. represents Pan. What does E.T. tell Elliot before he leaves him? And goes on the ship to go back to the spirit world. He has to cross over the rainbow bridge. He tells Elliot, I'll be right here. All right. He points to the third eye. Because E.T. was conjured by Elliot. That was mind activation. Okay. That's why he had to go out to the woods to deliver E.T. back to his world. E.T. was Pan. Remember E.T. helped the little boys fly just like Peter Pan did? I wish that they would let me upload my damn E.T. breakdown. You two are so damn stupid. But, um, yeah, man. It's, it's easy. And don't you know, Quincy Jones told, uh, stated, I don't know if it's further down in this article or in the GQ article. He said, when they did the design for E.T., the original design, Steven Spielberg asked him to come look at it. And he told Steven Spielberg, you got to change this because it looks too much like a brother. And a lot of you don't understand, E.T. is meant to represent Kush, the diviner, E.T., Ethiopian. All right. Kush was the forefather of the Ethiopians. He was also, once again, the great diviner. He was Hermes. OK, a.k.a. Pan, a.k.a. Pata. All that rolled into one. And, and I mentioned this before. In the Etruscan mythology, he was known as Tagus, T-A-G-E-S. They said that a farmer was out in the field plowing and this entity popped out of the ground and was able to predict the future and all these other events. Where did, where did Elliot first encounter E.T. when he ran out into the field? Right. But anyway, let's continue. So, yeah, like I was saying, Quincy Jones said he saw the first design for E.T. and he said that looked too much like a brother. You got to change that. And he said, that's why Steven Spielberg gave E.T. blue eyes. Because <laughs> E.T. is Kush, the, uh, the Ethiopian. All right. <laughs> Let's see here. OK, I think we're about done. They asked him if he's religious. He says, no, of course you're not religious. You, you, you venerate Lucifer. You, you're your own God. But he makes a point about the Catholic Church. Yeah, the Catholic Church is just a big, uh, they're, they're, the, they're the biggest crime syndicate on the planet, the Catholic, Catholic Church, allegedly. Oh, it says here, he says, and big money came from TV producing, the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. That was huge for me. Like I already stated, that was the introduction for Will Smith, at least as a, as a mass celebrity, we know that he had fame in the music world. You know, parents just don't understand things like that. But the, the, the name of the show, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, was an allusion to Heru. They were playing out a Heru or a Horus ritual with Will Smith. Okay? The Prince of Bel is Heru. Right? The son of Bel is, is Heru, Nimrod. After they make... Will Smith famous on that show. Then they have him engage in homosexuality and six degrees of separation. And then, of course, they bring him to fame and in, uh, Independence Day and then men in black. But anyway.
How much did your upbringing and difficulties with your mother and growing up in real poverty affect how you perceive success? Of course, it affected it. I appreciate the shit I have because I know what it's like to have nothing. Once again, his mother suffered from schizophrenia. And like I was stating about all these celebrities that he talks about, whether it's James Baldwin, Richard Pryor, Marlon Brando, Marvin Gaye, all these pansexuals, they always have these massive mental and psychological issues. They always end up trying to kill themselves or getting killed because they, they really want somebody to kill them. And they have these unbelievable drug issues. But they get venerated by regular people. Like if you say something about Richard Pryor, people want to fight you. Richard Pryor hated his own life. He was crying out for help. And you people don't want to help him because you, you want to be him. So how could you help him? He don't even want to be there anymore, but he was a slave to fame. Right? These people in the entertainment industry, even in the sports world, they're slaves to fame. Their life don't belong to them. You know, but, I mean, hey, man, it is what it is. All you got to do is track how Marlon Brando's life ended. And uh, Richard Pryor. And, of course, Marvin Gaye. Marvin Gaye also was a cross-dresser, by the way. Not just his dad was, but so was he. Okay? He was a damn cross-dresser and a pansexual. It wouldn't shock me if there was some molestation going on. Who the hell knows? All right? Who knows? It wouldn't shock me. We know that there certainly was some with Michael Jackson. We know that there was some from Quincy Jones. Quincy Jones was also doing things to Michael. Michael was getting passed around the industry like a blunt. All right? Not to be crass, but he was. All right, now he's talking about his mother, how she died. So that's it on that. So, no, do I think that Quincy Jones was wrong for what he said? No, I don't. I think he was just honest. I have no problem with people telling the truth. I don't find it to be controversial at all. I don't find it to be shocking at all. Black people have this thing where they say, how could you say that about a dead person? They can't, they can't defend themselves. Look, um, so-called black people have this fake sense of, of allegiance and loyalty. Black people are more, are more loyal to people who are dead than they are when they're alive. Now, you can't say anything about Tupac or Michael Jackson or Marvin Gaye and Richard Pryor, all these other people. But when they were alive, so-called black people was the ones who were split on them 50-50. So the problem with our people is that they venerate celebrities and they and they worship the dead. Instead of just appreciating people for their overwhelming talent. Richard Pryor was a phenomenal comedian, but he was a no, he was a tortured soul. So was Marvin Gaye, so was Michael Jackson. So instead of putting them on a pedestal, you just you know, you just accept the good but you address the bad. Cuz if you don't address the bad, then the problem keeps going on and on and on and on. That's why you have all these little boys out here getting adulterated, molested. Nobody says anything. But if you look at a woman wrong, you got to go to jail for life. Like, come on. Give me a fucking break. But anyway, peace.